Hey guys, John Paulamy here, Actionable Intelligence. Today is Saturday, August 5th, and this is the weekly market update. The disclaimer, anything that you hear or see on this podcast or video is not to be taken as investment advice. I am not a financial advisor. Please do your own due diligence. It's your money. It's your responsibility. All right. So first chart for this week is um, there was a lot of discussion about the fact that one of the rating agencies, Fitch, I believe, downgraded the U.S., United, the United States, its debt. And uh, I'm actually surprised that this had happened sooner, uh, but uh, it makes sense inside the context of the deteriorating physical fiscal conditions of the United States. And quite frankly, the United States, if they had to mark to market all of their liabilities, it's bankrupt country. Um, so I'm not going to get too much into it. I'm just going to, I've talked about this before. It's an inevitability that we are going to have a crisis because of the debts, because of the unfunded liabilities. Um, as I've said before, there's really no leadership that I see there's no constituency for cutting spending in this country and getting the financial house in order. And we may have already passed the point where uh, anything can be done, even, even if the political will existed. You know, I've said this before, I heard this from somebody and I, I continue to use it when people bring these issues up is the fact that uh, whatever is politically possible to do in Washington will not be sufficient to deal with the problem. OK, and uh, what is politically possible, it's just, it, you know, and, and what needs to happen to fix the problem is not politically possible. There's no constituency uh, for any of this. You know, I'm not going to get into my I have another slide at the end, which I'll get into this some more uh, and people can tune off from the financial stuff. But uh, this is just going to get worse now. This inflation fighting tact that the Federal Reserve is on having raised rates, you see what it's done now. You now have federal interest payments. You see how the interest has taken off on the debt since they went through this rapid rise in the Fed funds rate is now poised to top a trillion dollars. And I'm sure that will make the news when it actually happens. Um, when it gets, you know, we're like $980 billion a year in interest right now. So basically, you're paying more on interest on the debt um, than you are for the defense budget. So it's like, this is like the third largest expenditure, I think, after the entitlements in the federal budget. It's consuming, you know, a fifth or a quarter of the tax receipts coming in. So, you know, it's kind of akin to the person that's at the grocery store buying, you know, food on their credit card. The person that doesn't pay their, you know, pays the bare minimum on their credit card balances, you know, person doesn't even own the underwear they're wearing. So, you know, that's what that's what the United States is now. It's a it's an empire in decline. It's a Potemkin village. It's a facade. It's a shell. It's a husk of what it was. And we and you see that happening. And this is a symptomatic of it. And so this can't continue forever. This is another reason why I think interest rates will be cut sooner rather than later. Uh, I'll have some other slides here to show you. But uh, this, th these type of things are not actionable because just because something is certain doesn't mean it's imminent. That's why I do hold gold, physical gold. That's why I am invested in hard assets. That's why I'm looking <clears throat> overseas for investments because the United States is uh, got a big problem. The entire West does. It has the same problem. And the world, in fact, does. Uh, it's over indebted. So... This was a, um, this is debt held by the public percent of GDP. You see the, these are previous historical highs, like in 1946, that was after World War II. That was here, you know, you were over 100% of GDP, 106%. The average for the last 41 years has been 49%. And uh, now we're currently at 100%. And that's because uh, we just keep running up the debt. Uh, the last, you know, the president's, during their terms, the, the debts just double every, you know, 
eight year term or whatever four eight year term so it's it's both parties um it's it's the people in the u.s they don't want spending cut okay uh, if they wanted spending cut they would they would vote for people who do that but there's like i said there's no constituent constituency for that uh, the people that are sent to for office i mean if you're a congressman and you're on a two-year term you know you, you're not incentivized the incentives are not in place uh to um you know force these people to be fiscally uh prudent and uh you know you can then you hear people say well we need to change the incentives you know we need to say that you know like warren buffett said one time um we need to make a law that if the the budget's not balanced then you can't run for re-election yeah but who's going to pass that the people that are there are going to pass a law like that i mean th this is stupid this is historical this is nothing new throughout history empires run out of steam because they get over indebted they get militarily over their skis they get corrupt and they just break down the mor morality breaks down it's nothing nothing new this happens many times throughout history, and that's what's happening now in the U.S. So you're living through it. Is it actionable for a newsletter pick? Not necessarily, but I think there's things that people can do to protect themselves and see what's happening. You know, you, what 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 happens usually with these, as I've said before, is it goes on and it goes on and it goes on until it can't go on anymore. And then all of a sudden a crisis happens. And then you go to bed on a Friday night and you wake up on Saturday, like you've seen in many other countries, and you can't. You're in the middle of a crisis and the government's locked down bank accounts and then all the stuff that happens, happens. Bank bail-ins like Cyprus and all this other stuff. So I don't know what will happen. I don't know the timing. I'm just pointing out that this is not sustainable and uh, you can expect this to get worse, not better. And uh, right here, say so, uh, projection, projected data. This, this is the projections from the U.S. government itself. OK, and this is where debt's going over time. This is not going to be sustainable. You're not debt's not going to uh, go to these large percentages. The country will I mean, it'll, it'll implode well before that. Now, it's possible that, you know, we could have this tremendous AI revolution and productivity increases, you know, astronomically. And all this just goes away because so much wealth is created. But I don't think that's what will happen. Um, we're already at above levels of debt, like, you know, we went into debt in World War II and we were at 106% of GDP. And we paid that down over time. Uh, not necessarily paid it down. What they did is they instituted things like yield curve control. You're gonna hear, start hearing more about that. You're hearing about that in Japan. You're gonna hear about that eventually in the US. And what that is, is uh, keeping the rate of interest below the inflation rate so that you have a negative inflation rate or a negative real yield. And that's basically how they uh, will steal wealth from people to lower this number. Uh, Russell Napier, if you're interested, is a guy that talks about this quite a bit, how yield curve control will be used, how the government will use legislation to force banks and pension funds and insurance companies to buy the government debt at below the inflation rate and they'll basically just slowly steal uh wealth that's that's how that's done you know if you have a positive interest rate real rate then uh you know where the interest rate is above the inflation rate then that's a good thing right but that's not uh going to happen uh going forward you're going to have a situation where they hold the like i said the the, the fed will buy sufficient treasury securities to um keep the rates below the inflation rate and uh slowly over time you erode the uh the the value of the debt and if you like i said force you know it's very easy you could pass a law and say well you know the american uh whatever rehabilitation act and we're going to do this this and this and oh by the way people in 401ks uh you have all this trillions of dollars of wealth you need to do your fair share a certain amount percentage of your 401k needs to go into a, a a government bond fund and you'll be forced to do that they'll force the banks to buy it they'll force pension funds and uh insurance companies to do it and that that there is precedent for that around the world that's that's not that's not something that's unique okay and you will see more of that
you will see that in the U.S. eventually. You will see more QE. You will see uh, us running a higher inflation rate. That's going to get sold to you also. They're going to do whatever they can except for cut spending and live within their means. They're just not going to do that. So this was a tweet. I've talked about this before, uh, but I saw this tweet. So I just wanted to remind you of this, that uh, about 44% of federal debt, that's $15 trillion, by the way, is uh, sub two years duration. That means we got to, uh, the, the, the treasury has to roll 15 trillion in federal debt in the next two years. Uh, that will, if you don't think QE is coming back, then uh, if you think rates are gonna stay at 5% when they're gonna roll 15 trillion in the next two years, uh, you're not paying attention, that's, that's not gonna happen. And as I've said before, you know, I've talked about this, uh, we're, we're, I think we've, we've peaked, the rate cycle has peaked, yes, I track uh, 130 to 140 central bank uh, rate uh, what decisions, if you will. And I'm already starting to see uh, countries that were on the forefront of raising rates, like in South America, uh, they're now cutting rates. Rates, it, it's, we're still not into a, where I can say we're in an overall new liquidity cycle, but um, I saw Brazil uh, instituted uh, cut rates by half percent, Chile, Uruguay, um, and these were countries, like I said, that were the first to start raising rates when the inflation rates took off there. I mean, you have a situation in Brazil. I talked about it with subscribers in the newsletter and on my Discord. Um, I'm very bullish on Brazil. Uh, and, you know, you have a situation where rates were at 13.75% and the inflation rate was at 3.16%. So they're going to enter a new rate raising cycle. Uh, you can go back in time and see what happened with Brazilian stocks the last time they did that. And this is going to be happening in the context of what I believe is going to be a decade long uh, resource bull market. And uh, Brazil is a very resource intense um, uh, economy. It will benefit from that. So anyway, getting back to the slide here, you know, you have uh, along with about, so you have, you know, 44% of the federal debt needs to be rolled in the next two years. And along with that, you have about $2 trillion of commercial real estate debt. Much of that is currently in a negative net present value projects. And you're seeing, we've talked about that on this channel, uh, the highlights at least, uh, you know, the high profile where, where these big investment funds are just walking away from these $100 million buildings or, or hotels or what have you. And, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's going to, that again, uh, that's going to, that's symptomatic of a problem. Uh, not, uh, that's not a good thing. If, if it was a one-off, it'd be something, but it's like, we have multiple examples now of this of commercial real estate blowing up. So, and people just walking away from the debt at some point that becomes an issue. Uh, this Michael Taylor says, uh, here says, in my honest opinion, very likely to witness a return to QE and yield curve control before year end 2025. I do not see a probable mathematical alternative. Well, we will see. Uh, Luke Groman is another one, another person that I follow that uh, talks about this all the time. And he talks about the mathematics and, and uh, the, you know, what's Janet Yellen, how is she going to sell all this debt? Uh, who's going to be the buyer? You know, who's, who's going, how high are rates going to have to be in order to buy this? And do you, you know, are, what's going to be the duration on this paper? You know, and, and if rates are staying at this elevated level, like people seem to think. Yeah, you know, and a lot of paper is going to come to market and who's usually the buyer of last resort? Well, it's the Fed. So I wanted to talk about this. Jesse Felder had a good tweet. I wanted to remind you of this. Uh, I talked about this maybe a couple weeks ago and I had people in the comments. They were like, yeah, you don't understand. AI is new. Yeah, I get it. I get it. No one knows the future. Very well could be uh, that I'm wrong. I don't think I am. Um, you can go back and, like I said, and look at the work that Jeremy Grantham and GMO has done on cyclically adjusted PE ratios. You can go to Med F F Faber's website. Um, he's done a couple papers on cyclically adjusted PE ratios and showing that the more that you pay for uh, stocks or the higher that markets are on their PEs and their cyclically adjusted PEs, what the forward returns look like. And they're consistently, the more you pay, the lower your returns are. It's the, 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 the research has been done. So I go with probabilities and I go with history. Very well could be that the seven or eight stocks that are leading this thing higher 
uh, that everybody's jazzed up about um, in the market overall, uh, selling at 25% of, you know, PE of 25% that, you know, it's a new era and it's different this time. I'm betting that it's not. It's never different this time. There's nothing new under the sun. And so Jesse Felder points this out in his tweet. The Magnificent Seven boasts an average P.E. ratio of 43. Uh, guys, that's really high. You need to understand what that means. Read the, I'm going to put links to the Meb Faber research paper about uh, P.E. ratios and the more that you pay, what your forward returns look like. I'm going to put a link to that. I'm also going to put a link to the letter that Sun Microsystems um, CEO Scott McNulty wrote to his shareholders. This is a famous letter that he wrote to them about overvaluation of a stock. He was talking about his own company and how high that the, how overvalued it was on PE ratio and what that meant he would have to do to make Sun Microsystems uh, uh, investment turn out well for the shareholders. You'll be shocked. And so if you're not going to, if you want to speculate on these stocks and have a greater fool theory and speculate that the market's going to go higher because of FOMO, that's perfectly great. That's called trading. That's speculating and trading. Some people do that. Some people are very successful at doing that. I don't begrudge them. I'm not a trader. I don't, I'm not able to do that. I don't, you know, I try not to uh, buy things with the, with my out being um, that somebody some greater fool is going to come along and pay more than the over the over pay more for an overpriced security. Okay. Um, I try to buy things that are very cheap and have a catalyst and uh, give me downside protection. Uh, it doesn't always work out, but it works out more often than not. I just don't play in these, in these type of arenas and try to trade these things and uh, in and out. And, you know, like I said, I will put the, um, the links to the two to the scott mcnulty letter to shareholders this is done during the tech bust so it's a 20 year old letter but it, it makes the point and the guy is the ceo writing about his own stock and you can look up what happened to sun microsystems and you should also read the med med faber research paper it shows what if you pay certain at certain cyclically adjusted pe ratios for markets what their 10 year forward returns look like and like i said before the more you pay it, it, it it's pretty pretty accurate the more you pay for securities the lower the lower your return is uh not necessarily for individual securities some securities uh have a growth rate but when you already have a trillion dollar market cap on some of these things like apple for example has what i don't know what couple trillion dollar market cap and its sales are not growing and so what 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 are you doing why are you buying that it has a market cap equal to like 8% of the US GDP. Does Apple account for 8% of the US GDP? I don't know. I've talked about this before. It's not going to get through to some people. Some people, like I said, they're just going to ignore it. I wish them well. Okay, so uh, if you've seen, the oil price has been up the last six weeks. It looks like the cuts that OPEC did and some of the... Um, you know, the, we've seen rig declines in the U.S. Uh, over the last weeks, if you will. And it looks like things are, you know, uh, supply is, you know, getting back into uh, with demand. You know, demand is increasing. It looks like, you know, whether we've pointed this out like over a month ago, demand worldwide, if you wanted to look at OPEX projections, the IEA, EIA, they were anywhere from 102 to 104 million barrels of oil this year. Uh, a lot of folks uh, thought that uh, in the second half is when we would see, we had a, like a mini glut here at the beginning of the year. We had to get through all that SPR stuff. The Russians pushing a lot of oil into the market. The Iranians uh, getting their uh, seaborne storage uh, discharged. So a lot of oil came into the market in the first half of the year. That looks to be reversing now. And so we've had a nice rally over the last six months. Again, I don't know what's going to happen. I'm looking at this from a long-term perspective. Um, I've been accused of, uh, you know, being negative on the oil price, uh, but that's not true. Um, I don't know exactly what will happen. I, I had a, you know, my portfolio is probably mostly in energy stocks uh, of one, one form or another. 
and the derivatives of that, i.e. offshore oil drilling, which is my highest conviction idea that I've had for the last year or so, at least. And uh, so I think that uh, those are rocking and rolling, and I think it will continue. I have some uh, junior uh, oil companies. I have an oil company in Long Life Reserve, low-cost producer in Canada that's doing very well. And I've held those stocks uh, for a couple few years, and I will continue to because I believe that uh, eventually, you know, if you asked me, what do I think three to five years from now, I think that the oil price will be substantially higher. We will make a new all-time inflation adjusted high, more than likely. But there's always a chance. It's not zero. Uh, I said on one interview recently that there's a chance it could drop to 50 before it goes to 150. Uh, so uh, maybe that's not, that probability is lower now of dropping, but uh, you never know what's going to happen, right? And um, so right now, things are going our way into the end of the year. Draws, uh, uh, inventory draws are are going to be very, very bullish for uh, for the, the price of oil. And some folks, again, are now talking about uh, $100 a barrel. We will see. Uh, again, uh, there's insufficient investment. Investment is increasing, but this is going to take years to, uh, to um, manifest. So uh, a couple snippets from this article. Again, I, I will attempt to put the links to the articles where I can. Some of them are paywalled. Uh, I have um, sometimes a method to get around the paywalls, but I don't like to link that. Uh, uh, but I, I, I do read some articles that sometimes you can get around the paywall. Um, anyway, Saudi Arabia extends oil production cut. Oil prices jumped on Thursday after Saudi Arabia said it would extend its unilateral voluntary cut of 1 million barrels per day into September, adding that the cut could be extended or extended and deepened. At the latest meeting in June, OPEC Plus decided to extend the current cuts into 2024. Those cuts were originally intended to last between May and December 2023, but the largest surprise came from Saudi Arabia, the world's top crude oil exporter, and OPEC Plus leader, which announced a unilateral production cut of 1 million barrels per day for July. Quote, Saudi Arabia will extend the voluntary cut of 1 million barrels per day, which has gone into implementation in July for another month to include the month of September that can be extended or extended and deepened, the Saudi press agency reported on Thursday. So um, again, uh, one of the th things that I'm looking at is I go back to, this is happening in the context of, I said, like I said, of underinvestment that's been cumulative for many years. And I think another thing to really pay attention to that I want to reiterate is the fact that U.S. production um, basically, you know, comes from a lot these big shale basins. And we know for a fact that the Bakken and the Eagleford shales have peaked already or plateaued. And based on, you know, if you want to uh, give credence to the research and the analytical model that Goring and Rosenzweig have put together, which so far is, is being fairly prescient, uh, the Permian is forecasted to go peak and plateau within the next year to 18 months, probably closer to 18 months. So let's say 18 months to two years, it's going to plateau. So there's no other growth region of shale for the U.S. And so once this plateaus, that, that was the engine. I, again, go back and read some of the last Goring and Rosenzweig uh, reports about this where they've done the research, uh, what, you know, basically the shale revolution basically carried us through, uh, we've already been in an oil, uh, an oil supply crisis. So what happens when they peak? Uh, I, I'm not aware of any major shale basins in the U.S. which are getting ready to replace the, um, these three big basins. And then if you go to the Permian, it's really reduced down to four counties in the Permian, which are carrying a lot of the production growth. So we're getting to the end of the road of that uh bounty and uh i think that's why you're seeing this increase in offshore you know it's not like they need to do a lot of virgin uh, the oil companies don't need to do a lot of virgin exploration offshore they really already kind of know where a lot of they've done a lot of the seismic work they've done a lot of the ge geoscience work they know where a lot of the prospects are and they know where a lot of fields are already you know when you it took a uh, you know five to ten years down in Guyana to kind of prove it up, but now everybody's down there going crazy. I mean, the the, the 
Petrobras is sucking rigs into the uh, offshore Brazil. Uh, so they a lot of folks know where the oil is. It's just been a reluctance to drill these sites and make the billions of dollars of investment that are needed to develop these resources. Because what was the point if every time that you tried to do that, uh, you know, the oil price would go up and then it would get crushed by a, a surge in shale production. So I think the mindset has changed now. And a lot of the oil companies uh, need to replace the reserves, the big oil companies. And so they see offshore, you know, uh, being able to be viable at below below 50 and sometimes well below $50 a barrel. And so that's why you're seeing activity pick up there. So here's Noble Drilling, another offshore oil drilling company. Some comments from their recent conference call, which I th thought were relevant and apply to the entire industry. Uh, says here, this is from the conference call comments for the CEO. The reality is that, is that our industry has 12 or so remaining high quality drill ships in sideline inventory. These are ones that are cold stacked, by the way a few of which are soon to be absorbed on contracts, and then tier one ultra deep water capacity is tapped out. According to past cycles, this situation would have naturally triggered a supply response. He's talking about more rigs getting built. Typically first with a few early speculative new build orders by nimble entrepreneurs, followed by a combination of speculative and contracted new build orders by the large players. Numerous factors argue against that version of history repeating itself including cost and access to capital, shipyard complicity, current asset valuations, and risk aversion by public company management teams. Guys, this is all stuff that I've been talking about for over a year. This is why I've been so bullish on offshore. It simply isn't going to be the same cycle that you've seen in the past, where these guys cash flush, day rates go up, and they run to the shipyards and start building more rigs. Do I think eventually they will build more rigs? Possibly. But, you know, I think even during this conference call, they go through the economics of this. You know, why, when you have a valuation of your rigs of around $350 million each, are you going to go out and spend $850 million or a billion dollars to build a rig on spec? And then you'll need 10 years, you'll need that rig contracted for 10 years at minimum $650,000 per day to make it the investment work. It's not going to happen. Going on with the comments. New builds are way off the radar because even without the aforementioned soft constraints, the economics are simply entirely out of the money, just like I just said. Here we go. The current Tier 1 seventh generation drill ship would likely cost at least $850 million to build and require three years, if not longer, for delivery. Actually, I think it probably a lot of people think that would cost closer to a billion dollars, but we'll go with this. In order to underwrite that asset, a rational buyer would require a contract of 10 years at $650,000 per day or greater, or some variation of rate and term along those lines. Essentially, you would need a sponsoring customer to take a 15-year view on scarcity day rates. That's just not going to happen right now. The way the current market's set up, the way the animus towards hydrocarbons, we got what we got. And day rates are going to go up. Uh, do I think that eventually the zeitgeist will change? Yes. When I think when we have all-time new highs in the oil price and gasoline's eight or ten dollars a gallon, I think that the uh, political zeitgeist will change. And I, I've said this before, uh, as another long-term uh, view, that eventually you will see governments subsidizing hydrocarbon extraction the way they're currently subsidizing renewables with that type of emphasis, because uh, eventually uh, uh, it's going to become so painful that that's what, you know, that's what the response will be, because that's what politicians do, right? They respond to uh, the zeitgeist or whatever way the wind's blowing. And if the people are, you know, this is why you're seeing all these policies. It's a race, right? To see if the politicians and government policymakers can get you into 15 minute cities and take your cars away and all this other stuff before the oil price goes to $200 a barrel and they all get swept from office and we go back to rational, you know, rationality. Um, that's my view, at least. You know, I made the same prediction. I said that the Germans will eventually turn their nuclear reactors back on. It's simply going to be, it's simply a math problem. Unless you want to be poor. Unless you want to be poor, 
unless your standard of living wants to go down, unless you want to live like people did in the Eastern Bloc during, you know, the 70s and 80s, when the deterioration of, you know, uh, socialism and communism in the Eastern Bloc, you know, where everybody's poor, everything's shabby, nothing works. If you want to go back to that, then certainly um, we'll, we can continue on the track. And that's where they want you to be. But I don't think that that's what's going to happen. I think that uh, the zeitgeist is already starting to change. And policy, uh, you know, we're, like I said before, we've already seen center-right and right-wing governments come into like a third of the um, a third of the governments in the EU, for example. And, you know, there's half the population here in the U.S. that just won't stand for it. So we'll see. Uh, I could be wrong, but... Um, long story short we have a window of opportunity here for these drillers for the uh service companies that serve offshore if you listen to all the conference calls like i do you're just going to see the same kind of um uh tempo the same type of tune same type of uh reporting you know that everything's booming uh it's supplies constrained no one's going out and building anything new because they can't make the economics work especially in the context of who knows the future right people when you have governments in the west at least trying to get rid of hydrocarbons and so um i think that eventually changes but i think that that's years down the road and i think you're going to have all-time highs and day rates you know i think during the last boom in 2014 i think Day rates got to 600, 650,000. I think there was a couple signed. I think you, we're going to exceed that and people are going to be shocked. Um, I know one analyst that said that uh, he, or person, equity, private equity man or hedge fund manager that said that uh, he thinks that Val will go to, it's a thousand dollar stock eventually. I mean, so take that as you will. But uh, I think uh, this is going to exceed expectations on the upside simply because no one's talking about building anything new. And to affirm that, this is a slide from a Credit Suisse uh, uh, presentation. Um, here's the offshore drilling cycle. This is what has happened in the past. And this is why I don't think it's going to repeat. So basically what you see here is, you know, you have the trough of the market um, where you have, you know, Rig values decline, rigs get stacked, rates approach cash costs, you go into the trough, then as you see it, utiliza as you start ramping up again, activity, you have utilization increases, you know, the percent of rigs getting contracted, then day rate increases, we're seeing that, term duration increases, we're seeing that, and then typically what you've seen in the past is once these start happening, you start seeing those new build orders, just like the noble, uh, CEO was talking about. And then you have, you know, new build prices increase. None of this is going to happen this time. So where is the peak if none of this happens? If you don't bring new supply, what happens? You know, he talked about those uh, drill ships that are stacked. You know, a couple more, I think, are being brought out of uh, cold stack. And the drilling companies have so much leverage over the oil companies now. The oil companies have to pay for the refurbishment and the preparatory work and the, um, you know, get that thing out of, out of cold iron into preparing it to work. And that was, that's 40, $50 million, right. Or more. And so I think you have to go through those. And then how many of those drill ships are actually viable to bring back? I mean, I just don't know the answer to that, but regardless, I mean, you see, if you listen to the calls, you'll see like utilization rates in the Gulf. I mean, all over the world are basically 90%, well above 90, 95%, in some areas, 100%, where the rigs that are available are all contracted. So, you know, what happens if there's no new builds? Well, I mean, the sky's the limit, right? So we'll see. Uh, this is an article that was interesting. Emphasis on shareholder returns coming to an end, question mark. Why, what's the question here? Well, big oil, you know, has underinvested and had the focus on debt reduction and shareholder returns. And that has led to less reserves, right? And this is an extractive industry. And so that every barrel that you pump out, if you don't replace it, then you're eventually going to go out of business. So um, what will we see? Will we see starting to see a shift from a focus on, you know, a lot of debt has been reduced, which is good. 
Now are we going to see another capital cycle? Again, this would feed into offshore and other areas of um, oil field services, which are were completely decimated. And we have an industry that's you know quite smaller than it was at its peak. And so will it be able to handle all of the investment that possibly could come its way? Probably not. Snippets from the article. Big Oil's combined production was just 11.6 million barrels equivalent per day in the second quarter, the lowest in at least 15 years and more than 20% below the peak in 2010, according to Bloomberg Intelligence. Chevron disappointed analysts by guiding toward the low end of its targeted production range for this year. Shell and BP anticipate output will largely be flat through 2030, even after ramping up spending on fossil fuels. And Exxon Mobil volumes are hovering near the lowest in two decades with new projects offsetting declines elsewhere. While high shareholder returns are appreciated in the short term, oil and gas stocks still command a big valuation discount relative to other sectors on concerns these payouts won't be sustainable, won't be a sustainable long term as many nations push to phase out fossil fuels. Uh, well, we'll see about that, but I think they got this wrong. It's always, you know, the media always steers it to the end of fossil fuels, blah, blah, blah. Um, again, th this is why you have the opportunity, right? Because uh, that's, I don't pull out of this that they're, yeah, people don't like these companies uh, because of hydrocarbons. Some people don't, but smart people uh, do. There's a guy, I think he's in the Czech Republic. He became a billionaire by going around and buying up all these different coal mines and coal companies that nobody wanted. And coal's not going away. And he he ended up becoming a millionaire. I forget the guy's name, but uh, uh, yeah, I read an article about him. And does he, does he care? Uh, uh, you know, it's like, again, I go back to what Soros said. What we're trying to do here, one of the things we're trying to do here is determine the the view that's incorrect and bet against it. If anybody, you can get rid of fossil fuels, but you will have you know, I've said this before, you want to get rid of fossil fuels? How many people do you want to kill? How many people are you comfortable with dying? Because that's what will happen. Uh, these people that advocate for this, they don't really know what they're talking about. They don't understand thermodynamics. They don't understand energy. They don't understand anything. They're just useful idiots, okay? They live in a dream world, in a fantasy world, okay? It's, you can't have what we, the societies that we have in the West without gigantic amounts of of energy inputs and if you're going to get rid of some of the most significant energy inputs which are fossil fuels what are you going to replace them with if you did want to go to 100 percent rebuildables you still need tremendous amounts of fossil fuel inputs to make the transition this is the idiocy we're dealing with okay so regardless uh it doesn't really matter uh, this is an opportunity because this is the 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 thinking that's incorrect and uh, you have to bet against it. And so far, it's been working well for myself and subscribers to the Actionable Intelligence Alert newsletter. Again, it always it always changes, right? Remember when oil prices got to hundred and forty dollars a barrel during the last, you know, right before two thousand seven eight around that time? Nancy Pelosi was even saying that she was open to drilling offshore California. So what do we have? You know, after uh, this energy crisis that we're kind of in, they had a respite in Europe last winter. The winter wasn't bad, but now what do we see? UK commits to hundreds of North Sea oil and gas licenses. Just a year ago, they were putting windfall profit taxes on all the energy companies. And that's why everybody is not doing anything in the, North, in the UK North Sea anymore. Because why would you? The returns aren't there because of the windfall taxes. And so here we get this reversal now. The UK is now going to commit to hundreds of North Sea oil and gas licenses. You see, the political class are idiots. Why does anybody listen to these people and respect these people? There are half the population out there thinks that they're living in a democracy and these people have their best interests. These people are idiots through and through. They're just hand puppets for the establishment. They will do and say whatever they're told to do and say. It's that simple. From the article, Britain on Monday committed to granting hundreds of licenses for North Sea oil and gas extraction as part of efforts to become more energy independent, drawing criticism from environmental campaigners. 
Of course. You still have that stop oil where the idiots get in the street with their uh, vests that are made, uh, nylon vests, safety vests that are made from petroleum holding up traffic. Uh, you see those on, uh, videos on, uh, on, um, on uh, what do you call it? Twitter and, and, and things like that, Telegram. It says, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, you want to talk about a hand puppet. This guy is a definitive hand political tool hack hand puppet. This guy isn't even elected. He was installed as the PM of the UK. This is unbelievable. Anyway, confirmed plans for more than 100 such licenses, which attracted bids earlier this year and said hundreds of future licenses could also be granted. The government argues that stemming the decline in domestic supply would reduce the carbon footprint when compared with an alternative option of importing liquefied natural gas. However, it is facing legal challenges from climate activists and green groups who warn increasing fossil output is at odds with the goal. Do you know how many people are actually climate activists and in these green groups? Like 0.101%. Why are we listening to these people? They have an outsized amount of power because they have a lot of money. People give them money and they have a lot of outside sized impact. Again, when the price goes up, you're seeing it in, in the UK with these stop oil. People are bashing these people and pulling them by their hair out of the middle of the street and they're trying to get to work in the morning and trying to live their life. And these clowns and idiots are walking down the middle of the freeway arm in arm or sitting there in the middle of the street blocking traffic. Um, okay. Uh, they're going to have to do something about this windfall profit tax because they can issue all the licenses they want. But if people that are doing the projects are going to incorporate all the costs, including the windfall profit tax, then they can issue all the licenses they want. No one's going to, to commit capital if they feel like, you know, you have to get a return on your capital. People don't just do things altruistically. They're running businesses and they have to be able to get a return on the capital invested to make it worthwhile to do the project. Uh, people understand that, I hope. Uh, many people don't. So uh, we'll see what happens here, but this is the idiocy that we're dealing with. There's no real policy. It's just back and forth, swinging back and forth wherever the winds are. And, uh, you know, we'll see. We'll see what happens. I know a lot of the rigs left uh, the North Sea and went to other areas. So now dragging them back to do the work will cost additional costs too, which will have to be incorporated into the project costs. In the meantime, a country that actually has an energy policy, uh, China, approves six more reactors. China approves construction of six new reactors. China has improved the construction of six more nuclear power plants, according to a recent statement from the State Council of China. The new units will be built at Shaidao Bay Nuclear Power Plant in East China's Shandong province. There you go. So um, you can have a rational plan, long-term plan that makes sense. That, in, that uh, is based on, you know, pragmatism and physics, or you can have hand puppets who stick their finger up and, you know, do whatever the political uh, winds are blowing. That's, that's how they make, pol that's not a good way to make policy. So we'll see what happens next winter. I'll be interested to see uh, if uh, the Europeans um, make themselves, uh, have got themselves in a jackpot or if they get lucky and have another warm winter or if they've built sufficient LNG so they can buy high cost US natural gas from the Marcellus. So this was an article somebody sent to me. I thought it was interesting. It's worth taking into consideration. You know, we're big copper bulls here because of, um, I talk about the demand because of the energy transition. I don't really think the energy transition is going to happen to the scale that many people think for many reasons that I've explained before, but I still do believe that there's going to be a supply issue. That's what I think copper and a lot of these other resources are going to have a bull market simply because of the fact of the underinvestment. Uh, I do talk about the demand uh, scenarios that various people put out around energy transition, EV, solar panels, all this stuff uh, that gets you up to like, you know, 40 million 35, 40 million tons in the next 10 years of copper demand. But I don't think that that demand's really going to be there. I think that um, this is going to go out the window sooner rather than later as it just becomes obvious it's not viable and there's not enough money to pay for it and the resources aren't there. And so this article from BMO was talking about this and it was talking about substitution and scrapping, which needs to be taken into consideration. You know, as the price of something goes higher of a commodity, 
people will always look to um people will always look to substitute or in the case of copper you know the amount of scrapping goes up right people go around uh it's incentivizing people people respond to incentives and so i'll put a link to the article it's worth looking at i'm not necessarily you know being a tradesman i may not know what all the engineers and scientists are doing but uh you know, this idea that you can just replace copper with aluminum. Well, aluminum is a conductor too, and it is used, but it's not good to use because it's not a good conductor of heat. That's why we don't use aluminum wiring in houses because it causes fires. You know, the connections oxidize, causes a hot spot as the connection comes loose and then has the potential to cause a fire. So that's why we use copper wiring um, because it's the best conductor of heat. And electricity, when you use electricity and the amperage and the amps are flowing through your wiring, it creates heat. Uh, hook up a space heater and you'll you'll understand that. Um, you're leaning the pull at those, uh, you know, you're pushing. If you're running, you have a 15 amp breaker and you're running 14 amps, you're going to have some heat there in that wiring. And if you have if you have copper, it's able to dissipate it if, and deal with it. If you have aluminum, it's not the best for that. That's why we don't use that. And so the article is worth looking at because substitution and re-engineering things. So they use less wire and stuff like that. That will cumulatively over time have some effect. So anyways, the article says a new in-depth report by BMO Capital Markets examines the scope of copper demand destruction through thrifting and substitution, an issue that has become a common thread in discussion in the industry. BMO says in the absence of any further substitution or thrifting, copper demand could reach 40 million tons per year by 2030. Its prediction of maximum demand is up from 31.8 million tons last year or a 2022 to 2030 compound growth rate of 3%. But the authors say there is scope and in already instituted programs by original equipment manufacturers to use less or substitute copper entirely, including in electricity transmission and distribution networks, renewable energy capacity, communication cables, industrial air conditioning units, and the transport sector. So take a look at it uh, if you are interested in copper. I still think that the investments being made are insufficient. I reported last week, for example, that Cadelco, who's the largest copper producer in the world in Chile, their production was down 17% year over year. So it doesn't really matter if the supply or if the demand doesn't even increase when you have supply decreasing, uh, that can cause the, uh, the price to go up. So I think it's gonna be a combination of both. Supply um, will be constricted due to underinvestment and there will be some there will be demand just because as you know we have that area of asia i continually talk about india bangladesh pakistan indonesia philippines you know all those places china still um having this tremendous amount of population that's entering its s curves and is going to have demand for all things that are copper intensive excuse me so I wanted to point this out. This is an article in New York Post, and basically it was an article where, and I'm going to warn you now, this is going to be a rant. This, so if you're not into my political rantings, uh, you can go ahead and turn off. This is the last slide, and there'll be no more uh, investment or finance discussion. This is a something I want to point out. Uh, it's an opinion, if you will, editorial of mine. So you have Senator Dianne Feinstein, you know, she's 90 years old and she's basically broke down uh, mentally. I don't know. She's gone. She's 90 years old, for heaven's sake. So anyways, in her private life, she's given power of attorney to her daughter to deal with her financial and personal affairs, specifically some lawsuits and some wrangling going on with her late husband's estate and his children from a previous marriage, I think. And there's some arguments going on. So she's not, so in her personal life and when, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars are at risk, she's not mentally there to deal with that. Um, so she's turned over to her daughter. That's a fact. That's what they reported. Um, but for some reason, she's mentally capable to continue serving in the Senate. What's more mentally taxing or as mentally taxing? You're making policy you're dealing, you're on committees, you're being wheeled around in a wheelchair. She looks like the crypt keeper. 
I mean, the woman's 90 years old. I'm not picking on her. When you're 90, you're 90. I mean, you're at the end. And your mental fac faculties decrease. And, uh, you know, it's just probably you shouldn't be in the U.S. Senate making decisions or trying to do this. So what's going on here? Narcissism, power, just trying to hold on to power, uh, whatever, you know. So um, here's from the article in the New York Post it says California Senator Dianne Feinstein has relinquished power of attorney to her daughter, even as she continues to serve in Congress at the age of 90. The Democratic senator, who is the oldest member of Congress, has faced calls to resign after health complications kept her away from the Capitol for months earlier this year. Feinstein handed over power of attorney to her daughter, 66-year-old Catherine Feinstein, in part to help handle legal battles over her late husband, Richard Bloom's estate, the New York Times reported on Thursday. So again, you know, this isn't the only instance. You have this uh, babbling, brainless idiot Fetterman that the people of Pennsylvania elected. He's mentally incompetent. He can't put complete sentences together. He's serving. You have... A Mitch McConnell freezing up on TV like last week or the week before on a press conference. He's in his like, basically what this reminds me of is when I was a kid watching as the Soviet Union was getting into its most decadent, desperate times when it was falling apart, you had the old guard, right? You'd show, they'd show the Politburo or they'd show some parade in Moscow on the news, uh, on the evening news and all these geriatrics would be standing up there. They're all, you know, 80 in their 80s, they're all decrepit, falling apart, and they were holding on to the the old guard, they called it, right? Holding on, you know, still wed to the ideas and the and the past accomplishments of the Soviet Union of the, you know, 50s and 60s. You know, these guys came out of the uh, Great Patriotic War, and, you know, now they're in their 80s, and the whole thing, they, there's no, they're just there, okay? There's no, you know, with the challenges that the Soviet Union had, uh, these people weren't the people, uh, the point I'm making here is these people weren't the people that were going to be able to continue and make the reforms necessary because they just are decrepit, broke down, and you, not mentally competent. There was a period there where I think you had, you went through, you know, after Brezhnev died, you had succession of Soviet leaders that were just there for like sometimes a year or less. I mean, Cheryanko and Dropov, all these guys, they would get, they would become the new premiere, then they would die, they were already sick, uh, or who knows what. And so you just had this whole state apparatus trying to hold up the old, the old way of doing things. And that's what we have here in the US. I mean, we have this, <laughs> we have this Fetterman, we have this McConnell, we have this uh, Feinstein, we have all these decrepit, you know, same thing in the Congress, we have all these people that have been there for, you know, 30 years, you know, there's no new ideas. There's no, you know, nobody's, it's, it's, it's just a big hold on, keep the game going for as long as possible. Cause they're all hand puppets for the most part. Yeah. There's some people in there that are like, you know, bomb throwers on both sides, but they're like relegated to the back benches. No one listens to them. They're not, they don't have any real power. And so this is what I'm, what I'm trying to make is this ties into that whole thing I was talking about at the start about the debt and all the other issues we have. What, what's Diane Feinstein? Is she going to be proposing legislation anytime soon? I mean, she doesn't, we don't even know if she's, you know, cogent. Okay. We don't know if, what's wrong with McConnell. He's the minority leader. I mean, you, you get my point. You got this Fetterman uh, doofus, you know, doddering around. He's just a placeholder. You know, is he, is he proposing any legislation? What is he, he's got people around him handling him. That's what it ends up being part of that whole apparatus, right? That whole statist apparatus, of apparatchiks, you know, he's just there. He won the election, but he's not really doing anything. So, you know, it is what it is. Uh, if you think that you're living in a 1950s civics class and, you know, you're voting and it's making some kind of change, you're not going to vote your way out of what's ha going to happen. Okay. The United States and in the West totally is in decline. It, that should be obvious now. A lot of people don't want to accept that. But if you think that this is the political class that's going to <laughs> fix all these problems that we have, uh, I, 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 we're just going to have to disagree. I just don't, I don't think so. There's, you know, and so 
you're going to just, you know, keep doing what they're doing. I mean, you got the president himself is a doddering idiot. He's he's mentally incapable, incapacitated. OK, he has he has uh, dementia and we're all pretending that this is all you know fine and normal. Well, at least the press does. So that's you're going to get what you get. And uh, we'll see what happens. But uh, I, I, I wouldn't be optimistic that the problems uh, that I've talked about before, you know, having a real energy policy, what you're going to get is just like I said, depending whoever has power, their hands on the wheels, they're going to give priority to their constituencies, which are not you. Uh, the people, individual people of the country are not, is not what they care about. They care about the defense, the defense uh, companies that give them money, okay? So that money goes to the defense contractors to build weapons. A certain amount of it gets circulated back to congressional uh, contributions. The pharmaceutical industry is one of the biggest, if not biggest, lobbyists of Congress. It gives them money. Um, the teachers' unions, uh, they get paid. You pay property taxes so they can indoctrinate your kids and all kinds of weirdo stuff. And then guess what? A certain amount of that goes back to democratic politicians. Those are the people that they serve. They don't serve you. You don't matter. And if you think differently, then you're a fool. That's all I can say. And you're not, you're not going to make it. Okay. So uh, there you go. I know a lot of people will disagree with that. A lot of people have this romantic vision that, you know, our votes we're going to go door knocking and hand out flyers and we're going to vote and we're going to make change and then we're going to you're not going to make any change there there's a there's a state apparatus of apparatchiks and mandarins that called the bureaucracy that never leave and they are the ones that you know make all the policy you know if you come in as a radical and you're going to you know like this vivek ram Sawani guy he's going to get rid of this department how many times have you heard a politician say they're going to get rid of a one of these cabinet departments. It's not going to happen. It won't happen. They talk big on the, it's not possible. The Congress isn't going to go along with that. Okay. There's too embedded of a constituency. And if you're there for two years as a congressman, what benefit is it to you? You're not incentivized to do that. You're incentivized to bring the pork home, you know, walk around uh, when you're not up in the Congress uh, and, and vote for bills that, uh, benefit the people that give you money because you need money to be in politics okay mr smith goes to washington was a movie folks it's not reality okay that's it for this week um appreciate the support appreciate the um the uh viewership the channel continues to grow the newsletter continues to grow by the way i'll be looking to raise prices yes inflation has come to the actionable intelligence alert newsletter um, prices will be going up. Uh, it's currently $150 per year, 12, 12 issues uh, with the stock uh, recommendations that I, what I'm doing, they're not recommendations, it's what I'm doing in my own portfolio. Uh, you can give get some ideas from that. Um, access to the Discord channel where we have a lot of smart people uh, interacting. You get a lot of ideas there, a lot of real-time information. And uh but, you know, my costs are going up and just like everybody else, uh, we held the line here for a couple of years, but I think that we'll be seeing an increase in prices. So if you are inclined or if you were thinking about subscribing, I would go ahead and do that. I will say that current subscribers will be grandfathered in under the uh, under the current pricing regime as they were. I have founders that were founding uh, my first subscribers that are still paying seventy nine dollars a year. Uh, and then we raised prices to 150 a year, and uh, those people will be grandfathered in too. So uh, new subscribers will be looking at a price increase probably in the next month or so. So uh, look for that. So if you are interested, uh, avail yourself of a subscription now and lock in that uh, $150 uh, a year price. Okay, guys, that's it for this week. We'll talk to you next week. Thank you.